This Sunday's image of how the risen Christ shares his life with us is the image of the vine. Christ is the vine, we are the branches. Baptism makes us a part of Christ's living and life-giving self and makes us alive with Christ's life. As the vine brings food to the branches, Christ feeds us at his table, and then we are sent out to bear fruit for the life of the world. We welcome you to worship today, the fifth Sunday in the season of Easter in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake has forgiven us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word. Our first reading is from the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jer Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So we got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of, the, of, the, of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship, to worship in Jerusalem and was returning home seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. 
What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for this day comes from Psalm number 22. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perf perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord who rules over the nation. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the, is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself in a unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, you sent your Son into the world that we might live through him. May we abide in his risen life so that we may bear the fruit of love for one another and know the fullness of joy. Amen. As a newcomer to Southern culture when I first moved to South Carolina, I'll be the first to admit that there was a bit of a learning curve that was involved, but I was immersed into at least one aspect of that education pretty quickly. I had not long held my position as a process engineer for Owens Corning when my supervisor called me into his office one morning, and he shared some contact information while instructing me to coordinate an on-site visit with one of our customers, a, a large textile manufacturing firm in rural Georgia. So I called the number that I was given, and I arranged a time for a meeting and then asked my contact for the address of the plant. Well, he said, I'll give you the address, but it won't do you much good. You'll not find us on any map. Well, then can you give me some directions? Well, sure can, he said. They're real easy. Okay, go ahead, I said. I'm ready to write. Well, what you're going to want to do is look for a big building. It's the biggest here in the county. You can't miss it. Drive out the old highway past the cemetery until you come to the Smith Farm. It's, it's right across the street from where that barn burned down about 30 years ago. 
then turn left on the second gravel road and go until you come up on the big oak tree and you'll spot a road to the left. Well, you don't want that road. You want to drive to the road up on the right that you can't see. There's a big house there, almost a mansion. But it's surrounded by trees and it's not really visible from the road. Well, anyway, what you want to do is you want to turn there, then keep going till you see the seven mailboxes. Go about another quarter of a mile or so around the bend and then take the dirt road back to the plant. Just come in the front door. I'll be around there somewhere. You can't miss it. Our first reading for today. Well, it comes with some better guidance. The text comes from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And it speaks about the, the meeting of two men, one a high-ranking officer in the Ethiopian royal court. In fact, he's the royal treasurer. And the second, a man from Jerusalem by the name of Philip. The way that Acts tells the story goes something like this. Philip, an early Christian, is simply told by an angel to get up and go toward the south. He's to travel a wilderness road. Now, not too many of us hear angels, and not too many of us would get up and go someplace if we thought we did. But we do know what it's like to be on a wilderness road, to find ourselves in new and uncharted places, to feel insecure and unsure of the direction that we're to go, to wonder what's in store for us next. Philip, while responding to the angel's bidding, comes upon an Ethiopian eunuch who was, a who was evidently a person of faith. The Ethiopian had come to Jerusalem to worship, and now he's returning home, spending his travel time reading the prophet Isaiah. Now being spirit-led, Philip catches up to him and asks him if he understands what he's reading. And the Ethiopian responds by asking the first of three questions. How can I understand unless someone guides me? A common understanding between the early church and the church of our time is that you and I, we do not come to faith alone. We learn from others and we pass on what we know to the next generation. Education has always been an important component of the Christian faith and the best education doesn't happen in isolation. But that can be hard for us to accept, for we are people who value our independence and our individualism. Our whole lives long, we want to do it ourselves between childhood and maturity. And for all the ages in between, we want to be able to do it all. And we want to be able to do it all on our own. But you see, faith tends not to be that way. Faith is a team sport. We're much better at it when we pull together, when we learn from one another, when we interact with each other, when we reach out to others and experience their reaching out to us. In fact, most Christians will tell you, you can't be a Christian alone. It's, it's simply impossible for relationships are the basis of Christianity. God's relationship with us, ours with God, and our relationship with one another. And knowing how important relationships are, the book of Acts says that the Spirit led Philip to speak with the Ethiopian. Conversation always leads to relationship of one kind or another. So the Ethiopian engages Philip in a conversation about the passage of scripture he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And then the official asks Philip another question. Now this is the second of three, the middle question, the middle of the text. I had an Old Testament professor who always taught us to pay very careful attention to what we found in the middle of the scripture, in the, in the center, in, 
in the vertex of two lines drawn through a text in its intersection. He used to tell us that the word vertex comes from the same word as vortex, like a whirlpool. So what do you see in the center when everything is whirling around us? And then he'd tell us that the same word can also refer to the top of the head and it also means deep within the heart. And so what is at the center? What's at the center of this story? What pulls our head and our hearts together? Is the prophet talking about himself or is the prophet talking about another? Luke, the author of Acts, says that Philip began to speak and starting with the scripture, he shared with the Ethiopian the good news about Jesus. Well, aha. And that's our answer. Right at the center is Jesus. We don't point to ourselves or to our churches or to our denominations or even to great books or good programs like this one. Rather, like Philip, we're always pointing to Jesus who is at the center of our faith. And most often, that's the model we see from the earliest followers of Jesus, isn't it? As they're sent out into the world, they don't enter into debates about God or wrestle with the concept of a divine power. Simply, they always seem to point to Jesus. And that's just it for us as well. We don't have to make anything of Jesus because he stands on his own. In fact, he stands among us before we even know that he is here. On first hearing of Jesus, Helen Keller, that marvelous person, originally cut off from all hearing and seeing, who like the Ethiopian had no way to understand unless someone showed her. Helen Keller on first hearing of Jesus said, I just knew that there had to be somebody like that. <coughs> Jesus stands on his own at the crossroad of life. We don't have to make anything of him. He's there all along for us. But we do have to welcome him. We have to welcome him into the center of our own being. And that shouldn't be too hard because in truth, he's the best we have in human form to, to tell us what God's like. I remember standing in my seminary's bookstore. It's a great place to be, but, but you had to be very careful about what you said. You never knew who might be on the other side of the stacks. Well, one day I was just browsing along and I heard one of the students who was looking for a commentary for someone else and the clerk said, well, well, we don't have that one. All we have is Jesus. And all these years, I've loved that quote. All we have is Jesus. Indeed, that's all we need. But we do need him at the center, the crux, the vortex, the vertex, when life is swirling and when we're trying to keep our head and our heart together. We need to know who's at the center and therefore who can center us. And so when the Ethiopian asked Philip that middle question about whom may I ask as the prophet speak, well, Philip simply pointed to Jesus and that was enough. It was enough anyway for the man to ask Philip yet one more question, a third question. And his third question was this, what is to prevent my being baptized? You see, not only the, does this passage revolve around three stories, the story itself, the story of the Ethiopian is the center story of three baptisms, Simon the Magician in Acts 8, Saul and Paul in Acts 9. And if you take a look, what you'll find is that all of the baptisms are about people who are being invited to understand Jesus, who, who stands at the very center of it all. And the Ethiopian exclaims, look, here is water. And then he asks, what is to keep me from being baptized? What's to keep me from becoming a part of this movement that's called Christianity? And the answer, 
Well, nothing. Nothing at all. The truth of the matter is that we all need more of the ordinary made holy in our lives. We need more opportunity to act on our beliefs, to say that we have come to a crucial crossroad and that we know the way to go. In fact, some of those crossroads in life may lead us to ask our own questions. What is to keep us from living in the fullness of grace that was given us in baptism? What is to keep us from living daily into God's forgiveness and salvation? What is to keep us from living the new life in Christ Jesus? What is to keep him from centering us and people of God? The answer to all is the same. Well, nothing, nothing at all. And that, I would say, is very good news to share. Thanks be to God. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he, came, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and to answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church and your church abides in you. Cleanse us by your word and give yourself to the whole church on earth so that it bears fruit and witness to your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth. We marvel at the beauty of creation and seek to better commit ourselves in caring for all that you have made. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You ruled the nations with love and justice. We pray for our President Joe, our Governor Henry, and for all who are our elected leaders in nation, state, and community. We pray that you might give the leaders of the nations assurance of your abiding presence, that they might lead with love for those they are called to serve. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, sick, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially those whose names are upon our lips or within our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your Spirit. With them may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the, new hope of, in the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lift up your hearts. 
we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and ever-living God. But chiefly we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Lord. For he is the true Passover lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, living, and loving God, we praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We bless you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people Israel from the bonds of slavery, and for sending your Son to be our Redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who living among us healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death gave his life for others. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for remembrance, for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life that we may live as your chosen ones clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Amen. All are welcome at God's table of grace. The sacrament of Holy Communion offered each Sunday from 10 to 11 o'clock a.m. in our church parking area or within our in-person service of worship on Sundays at 11 o'clock a.m. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Again, the Congregation of Messiah Lutheran thanks you for worshiping with us, and we extend our heartfelt heartfelt invitation for you to join with us again next week, either online beginning at 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday, or by joining us for public worship at 11 o'clock a.m. in our sanctuary at 1106 Yemen's Hall Road. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.